Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. On the agenda tonight, we're going back to 1964. We're going to be taking a look at Jerry Lee Lewis and he's going to be performing a whole lot of shaking going on. So let's get Jerry up on screen and see how he gets on. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> you to wiggle around just a little, little, little bit. And honey, that's when you got something. Yeah. That's when you got something. That's when you have got something. Ooh. I'm just going to jump in here during this breakdown and the link to this is going to be in the description below if you guys want to watch it the whole way through without me interrupting it. But a really important thing to mention about this video is the time. It's 1964 and having this kind of performance, I'm sure, especially in the UK, let's throw that in there as well, that this was in front of an audience who would have been seen as more reserved than other audiences at the time. The crowd being so close to the piano and so close to Jerry as well, really getting into it. And this would have been a shocking performance to the older generation at this time because there was nothing like this in terms of the attitude and the energy, but also the innuendo, all of this kind of music that came along in the early 60s. Now, it's not shocking to us because we've seen everything and <laughs> we are so difficult to shock. But back in the early 60s, this would have definitely been frowned upon by the older generation. It's almost like the younger generation in the 50s and the early 60s felt oppressed because of their parents and how strict things were at the time. So in order to be able to get out there with your friends and go and watch a gig and listen to music like this, you can see what a release it is in the audience. Just the guys going crazy dancing, everyone trying to touch Jerry as well, holding his shoulder. And in this breakdown, when Jerry is saying the lyrics, we've got cheers after the things that he's saying because everyone is so into it and they're releasing all of that pent up energy that they've got as teenagers. Something that signifies the change in live performances from the 40s and the 50s into the 60s was the fact that 
in the 40s and the 50s, an audience, when they're watching a musical performance, would be sat down and there might be some light applause at the end of the show and even between performances, the next act would come on, but there wouldn't be an animated response from the audience. They were appreciating the music and that's as far as it went. Whereas the younger generation now were standing up. They were dancing. They were putting their whole bodies into the performances. They were shouting out during performances. So it was wild compared to the experiences that their parents would have had when they went to watch a music show rather than a gig. Now the youth were getting out there and they were getting into this rock and roll. It's interesting with this being the second pianist that I have featured on the channel just this week with Little Richard that I featured before. Very much that similar show element in there, getting everybody into the performances and talking about 1964, 1963, 1964, around the time of the British invasion into the USA with all of the UK bands that went over at that time. This is an example of Jerry Lee Lewis coming over from the USA and bringing that rock and roll to the UK shores. And around the same time as well, people have been listening to Elvis. This just goes to show how popular the rock and roll sound was in the UK coming from the USA. There wasn't really an invasion, especially considering that when these guys went back to the USA, they had to play second fiddle to those British invasion bands because they were just taking up the charts everywhere, especially with Beatlemania, with that all going on. I've mentioned that this level of performance, the energy within the performance hadn't really been seen before, or at least it wasn't the mainstream. Every single artist wasn't like this. And that's why Jerry Lee Lewis did stick out because of his interaction with the audience while he's singing, but also that shock factor of the kids, for example, saying to their parents that we're going to go and watch a gig tonight. And the parents might ask them, who are you going to watch? And they say, oh, we're going to watch The Killer. Just having that nickname as Jerry Lee Lewis did is shocking in itself. It's something that even nowadays you associate with heavy metal or death metal being related to killing and having masks and images that are shocking. It would have been exactly the same thing back in 1964 and earlier when Jerry was performing to have that nickname of the killer. It would have been something that went totally against the religious upbringing that a lot of youngsters around this time had. But the performance here with the energy, the attitude, getting everybody on side and also the composition and the name of the composition, whole lot of shaking going on. This is what was happening at the time. Everybody knew what the song was about, but the artists had to find a way of composing a song that had that subject matter in there, but they could somehow scoot around what they were singing about, even though everybody knew what it was about. And that's the reason why a lot of artists, Jerry Lee Lewis included, had their material boycotted by the radio stations because they sailed a little bit too close to the wind with a few songs. And that's what the game was. Obviously, we can look back to Elvis and what he did and the things that he injected into his performance to bring about that subject matter of the song and, if anything, take the song to a totally different place the way that he would perform it to put that little bit of extra appeal in there that the women couldn't resist. And this is, again, something totally different to the previous generation. Obviously, looking back now, it's tame because we're used to everything and we've been numbed with everything that we can see on TV now in the current pop industry. But back in the 50s and the 60s, this was really cutting edge with performance in terms of the risque nature of the performance. It was something that would have been shocking. Musically, we've got another situation where Jerry Lee Lewis playing the piano, you'd think it would be difficult to put on a show and be entertaining because you have to be stuck to that instrument. You can't move from it. But because Jerry Lee Lewis has the full band here, it means that he can break away and get into his vocals and also get into those showmanship moves that he would do. 
getting up on the piano and playing with his feet and getting the crowd involved, throwing his hair around, knocking over the stool as well. That was something actually that happened by accident the first time that he did it. But he got such a great reaction from the crowd, he then worked it into his standard routine of showmanship and it was something that just added to the energy of the performance. But we can see here musically how we've got this straight up rock and roll, but we always have this breakdown as well to get those dynamics in there, to have those peaks and troughs dynamically to keep it interesting the whole time. But we're going to be getting back into the performance. I want you to shake it, baby. I want you to shake it one time. I want you to shake it one time for yourself. Yeah. And then, honey, I want you to shake it, but don't break it. Ooh, you can shake it one time for Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Honey, I ain't thinking I got me a whole lot of shaking going on. Now let's go one time shaking. Shake it, honey. I ain't baking. Pull out a shaking. 
And there we have it. This performance is so captivating because Jerry Lee Lewis just lets everything go with the showmanship getting up on the piano, continuing to sing. This is another thing that with all of the showmanship going on, you might forget that Jerry Lee Lewis has a great voice and can play an instrument. And it's no fluke that he's the center of attention here because of the ability that he had as a musician, as a singer on the records, getting in the studio and being so consistent vocally and being able to accompany himself, of course, but then playing live. It's all about engaging an audience and this guy could engage an audience like nobody else. Guys like Jerry Lee Lewis changed the face of live performances because once people have gone to see a guy like this who is as engaging as he is and puts on such a show, gets the crowd involved, as soon as the younger generation would now go and watch another act who didn't do that, it would have been a letdown. And around this time, again, the video that I did on Little Richard, another great example of somebody who played the piano, but got everybody involved and put on such a show live that going to watch somebody else after that would be so different because the shows were so different. And this is what the younger generation wanted. It is like a riot. It would have been seen as that by the older generation if they were to watch these youngsters getting into this new rock and roll. But having a look into Jerry Lee Lewis, how he started playing when he was only 14 years of age. That was his first live performance playing the piano. And going back even further, he started playing with his two cousins and his family actually mortgaged their farm in order to be able to afford a piano for Jerry to start playing. So having influences of Jimmy Rogers and Hank Williams as well, that's the avenue that he went down with his playing. Those two guys, by the way, have got videos on the channel somewhere if you want to find them. So with these influences and as Jerry was learning to play, his parents inducted him into the Southwest Bible Institute to make sure that the songs he was playing were evangelical songs and none of the evil rock and roll and blue songs that they'd heard about. The only problem was it did backfire because Jerry did a boogie woogie version of My God is Real at the Southwest Bible Institute. And after that performance, he wasn't invited back. And when he was at school, he also got expelled for playing this worldly music. So from there, having been expelled from school, he then went out and started playing at local clubs in Mississippi. So around this time, 1954, 1955, he was getting heavily into rock and roll. He had recorded his first demo and he traveled to Nashville. But unfortunately, the record execs over there said that he should change to guitar rather than playing the piano. And this is something that obviously record executives don't understand that it takes years and years to get good at an instrument to be able to play and sing at the same time. So you can't just switch it up and suddenly play guitar. So he stuck with the piano and in 1956 is when he went to Memphis and this is when he auditioned for Sun Records and unfortunately Sam Phillips was away at this time but Jack Clement was there and he recorded a couple of songs with him. There was one cover but also his track called End of the Road. So after a successful audition, he started working on his own solo material, but also worked as a session musician for the record label, given his talents as a pianist. And he played for guys like Johnny Cash and Carl Perkins. And the Carl Perkins song Matchbox has Jerry's playing on there. It was this time that Elvis dropped by the studio to see Sam Phillips. And Johnny Cash was there because he was there to listen to Carl Perkins while he recorded. And Jerry was there as well. So they got together and just started jamming because they were all there at the same time and the tape just kept running. They kept recording this and that release went on to be known as the Million Dollar Quartet. But I think that that 
approximation of their worth was quite modest, considering that you had Elvis, Johnny Cash, Carl Perkins, and Jerry Lee Lewis all on the same recording. Then in 1957 is when he released this song, Whole Lot of Shaking Going On, which was a big hit, but then Great Balls of Fire was released, which was a monster hit. But that was one of those songs that got boycotted by the radio stations because it was seen as controversial at the time, which is, of course, what you want if you're looking to publicize any release. If it is controversial, the young audience will definitely get into it. And that was definitely the case. So the showmanship was also one of those things that was prevalent because he appeared on TV for the first time in 1957. So people started to get a taste for his life performance and his ability to keep you engaged. In 1958 is when the news broke about Jerry's marriage to his first cousin once removed and she was only 13 years of age even though everyone with the record label said that she was 15 years of age it wasn't true so that was a big scandal and understandably he was taken out of the spotlight for a few years in 1961, he released What I'd Say, which was a cover version of the Ray Charles song, and that was a moderate hit for him at that time. In 1963, he then signed with Smash Records, and they had a song called I'm On Fire, and they thought that this was going to be his return. It was a great track, but unfortunately, the whole British invasion thing happened, and the Beatles happened, so all of the American bands and artists had to play second fiddle to all of those UK bands that were now coming in to the USA at that time and taking all of those chart positions. So unfortunately, with Smash Records, he didn't have any commercial successes. The one thing that he did have was a live album that was called Live at the Star Club Hamburg, and that was released in 1964. And it was quite a simple mic setup on the night, but those microphones managed to capture the energy of the performance, and it was the same year as the performance that we're looking at here. So that went on to become regarded as one of the best live albums and live performances caught on tape of all time. They did have a microphone set up in the crowd as well. So that's how they captured the atmosphere on the night. Entering the late 60s, Eddie Kilroy, who was his promotions manager at the time, suggested that he should go to Nashville and record some country music. And Jerry Lee Lewis had always played country. He hadn't released any, but he thought, why not? So they put together their version of Another Place, Another Time and released that in 1968. And it went to number four in the country charts, which is the last thing that they were expecting. It was a very nice surprise. And it just so happened that from this first release, they then kept on doing country music. And over the next nine years, he'd have 17 top 10 country hits in the country charts. So he was a huge country star at this time and his previous producer at Smash Records called Shelby Singleton had just purchased Sun Records from Sam Phillips and this was in 1969 and that meant that Shelby now had all of the old recordings that Jerry Lee Lewis did with Sun Records that they hadn't released. So Shelby repackaged these songs and released them himself at the same time that Jerry Lee Lewis was releasing his current up-to-date stuff with his new record label. And people thought that these old recordings were new recordings because they were so well repackaged by Shelby to the point where One Minute Past Eternity got to number two in the country charts, even though that is a really old song recorded so much earlier, but because it was released now in 1969, people assumed that it was new. This process actually went on for years because there was so much material in the vaults at Sun Records that Shelby could repackage and release as new material. I'm sure that people, when they buy a record, don't look on the back to see who the distributor is, who the record label are that are releasing it. They just see the name Jerry Lee Lewis and they buy it. He made a return to the pop charts in 1971 with his version of Me and Bobby McGee. In 1972, he released his version of Chantilly Lace. And in 1973 is when he appeared at the Grand Ole Art Prix. And the only problem with this is that it went on for 40 minutes. And the time limit for the Grand Ole Art Prix is eight minutes. So that was 
was his first and last performance. In 1977, he released Middle Age Crazy, and that did really well. It got to number four in the country charts. In 1979, he released Jerry Lee Lewis, and although it was critically acclaimed, unfortunately, it didn't sell well commercially. In 1986 is when he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and that same year, he released the album Class of 55, which featured Roy Orbison, Johnny Cash, Carl Perkins, John Fogarty as well. In 1989 was when the Great Balls of Fire movie was released, and Jerry re-recorded all of the songs for the soundtrack. In 1998, he toured with Chuck Berry and Little Richard. In 2006, he released the album Last Man Standing. And again, this was a huge album and had a lot of guests on. We had Jimmy Page and Willie Nelson, and Little Richard was on that as well. But it's great to have a look back at Jerry Lee Lewis in full flow here in 1964. And to finish with, Elton John said about Jerry that piano playing was sedate until Great Balls of Fire. And that's the impact that Jerry Lee Lewis had on not only audiences at the time, as we can see here, but future piano players who can now look up to a guy who really did put on a show and changed what it meant to be a pianist and the things that you could do whilst playing the piano. Definitely check out Little Richard if you get a chance. He's on the channel here somewhere as well. But thank you guys so much for suggesting this video for me to take a look at and keep those suggestions coming in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And I'll see you guys at the next one. Rawr.